So nice to be in person. Live again. Um, still feels like a gift. So thank you for coming. Thank you for being on Zoom. And I hope I can bring some answers to your questions, maybe some also inspiration to your your projects and what you'd like to do with native plants in your home gardens and in your communities. Um, I'm excited that Habitat Gardening in Central New York is 20 years old. And yeah, my time with these plants started a really long time ago. And I credit F.M. Newberry, who started the Native Plant Garden at the Brandywine River Museum in the Brandywine Valley for almost not everything. I, I've learned so much since then, but what an inspiration she was to me. So this is the entrance to the Monday Wildflower Garden in probably 2018. It doesn't look like that now. One thing that we can for sure know is that when we start gardens, they change. So um, yeah. But anyway, um, books are helpful. I and mean, I think everyone here is familiar with Doug, Doug Tallamy. Rick Dark was um, a, 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 another person who worked with Doug Tallamy and put together a book with Doug Tallamy. And Larry Weiner and Tom Christopher um, put together this book. Um, and I think this is another one, if you haven't seen it, would be a, a good one to check out. Um, we're going to talk about propagation today, and this whole program will be available to you. So we don't, I don't have to go through reading all of the, all of the slides. I know you know what a native plant is, um, but since we're recording, we might talk about the fact that it's something that grew in the same habitat in which it originated, and we we commonly say pre-colonization, and we have records that prove that to us. Um, we have the floras that were written before we started interrupting our landscapes like they are today. Um, and know that we know that plants can be native to large areas um, across the whole United States. Um, one of my favorites is the Danthonia spicata and Danthonia compressa, the poverty oak grass, grows all over North America, but it's also native to New York. And then we talk about our, um, uh, this, is a, this is a wonderful transitional slides, right? Um, <laughs> local genotype and ecoregion and how these ecoregions define our genotype. So what we want to do is collect in the wild. That's the most important place to collect seeds. Yeah, we like to collect from our gardens, from our own plants that we're, we're growing and they're right there in our, in our, our backyards or right out the door. Um, or familiar places, but it's really important that we continue to collect from many places across wide spans. So go to these populations of plants, get permission and collect um, over and over again. So we'll, we'll talk more about that um, as we go. Um, do the eco regions define local genotype? Yes, of course they do. And what are straight, straight species and what are cultivars and can we use them? And the answer is, let's try not to. Let's be really selective about the cultivars that we use because they're different. And Annie White's work has proved has proved that. So you can look up what she um, what she did and what she published to show us that the cultivars just don't work as well for the visitors. And who are the visitors? They're not us, but our local insect population, which is so important. So these are areas, our regions are many and varied in their areas of land and water defined by geology, landforms, climate, vegetation, and the processes. And look at this whole United States, each colored number is a different region. And then we can look at New York state and find many different places where different plants grow right within our own state. So yeah, we can move them around, but we should do it knowingly. And um, when we're working in the natural area, we tend to make sure that we're using plants like from the Cayuga Lake Basin would be in the Monday Wildflower Garden now. We're not trying to introduce plants that are um, stretching that envelope. Although there's always an exception, and when I have introduced a plant that's not exactly from the Cayuga Lake Basin, um, I ask permission from Robert Wesley, our botanist. And he goes, oh, Susquehanna River Valley. Okay. So yes, there are always exceptions to all of, all of the rules, but we, we keep trying to keep things local and collect locally. 
Um, and we all know in this room, we know all of those important things. And remember, they'll be there for you. And we all probably know about the insects that rely on these plants um, and what the habitats are. But sometimes we try to manipulate and that's okay. You can have a bog garden in, in your home garden. It's possible. Um, you, can, you can think about depressions as wet areas. Um, and you can also use gravel to create dry pavement barrens like we have in Jefferson County. Um, so some of the areas right around where, where I've been working look like this. And um, the dry areas, the old fields, we absolutely love them the bogs and fens, Cayuga Lake, cliffs, and that's the Monday Wildflower Garden um, filled with our Helianthus decapetalus. Um, think about plant communities during your planning phase and understand these types and go out and find a reference site if you wanna do a restoration project, even if it's right at home. And bottom line first, do not use plants that are wild collected. So that's why we're here today to learn about plant propagation. Um, so learn them, go out and find them, um, ask the questions about each species that you're interested in. And I love to think in layers beyond the flower. So you're going to think about the structure. If you're going to try to recreate a forest, which you absolutely can, think about the structure of the forest and the canopy, the subcanopy, the shrub layer, and the herb layer. And always reduce your lawn size and just keep growing, keep growing your plants. Um, it's important to understand whether they're available in the trade and will the local growers supply them and will they be stray species or cultivars and will you plan ahead and always is there time to collect seeds. This is the perfect time to have this conversation because we're in the seed collecting period. Um, well, the end of the seed collecting period, but now you'll be prepared for the next years to come and, uh, Seed collecting begins um, in, for us, it begins in, in June um, and it runs all the way through December. So you still have time to go out there and get, get seeds. And then there's stratification, which gets complicated and everybody wants to ask questions over and over and over, which is absolutely fine to ask these questions over and over about how do I stratify my seeds so I can get um, germination, so I can have success. Um, people said to me, this isn't easy. And, and I said, well, it, it is if you just have patience, right? And you do, you follow the steps. Um, so remember, it's a big cycle that we're going to harvest clean, uh, sow, stratify, and then bring them back into some kind of a moist, warm, with light environment, and then wait till the proper time to either pot up or plant them out. Um, this is how how we follow that cycle. Um, the volunteers and I, way back in 2013, from the Monday Wildflower Garden, went into the high hilltops to collect certain grasses and, and asters around this time, um, or earlier, eight, six. Well, we were looking for, we were looking for Gonia, that's right, one of my favorites. Um, and then we, we sit among ourselves, right? You know, make a fun group of talking, and having fun at the table, cleaning the seeds. And then they end up in dry, if they're large enough to put in the paper bag, that year was a great year for all of those species. We ended, we ended up having bulk amounts in our grocery bags. If they're smaller, they can go once they're dry into a jar and sit on the shelf for almost an entire year. And then they become plants at the plant sale. So the timeline is really important thing to follow and understand. And we're, we're not going to walk through every piece of that today because we wouldn't have time to get through everything. But knowing that you're harvesting, you're either drying or you're keeping moist, we're going to get to that part. Um, and make sure you label the name, the place, and the date you collected so that you can return to that place and go back and get, get them again. And um, the important thing to understand too, as I mentioned earlier, was collecting from various locations, the same species over time in order to have a genetically rich harvest of seeds of a single species. Does anybody have a question about that? 
Okay, you can just think about it and then we can talk as, as I go along. So that's, that's gonna be the thing that comes up over and over again about how we get, how we responsibly collect seeds for, for projects going forward so that we maintain the proper and um, rich amount of genetic diversity in our native plant populations. Cautions and exceptions. Okay, harvest only with permission. The conservation officer could give you um, a ticket for harvesting on state land if, if you're found there harvesting. It's really difficult to get permission to harvest in the state forest. So when you want to harvest seed, roadside's pretty good. We haven't had any problem harvesting on the roadside. There's a right of way. And as long as you're safe, you can harvest on the roadside. Take only 10% from a population of plants so that um, you're leaving some for those plants to propagate themselves. Um, not necessarily leaving for other people, but you know, want those seeds to be able to dehisce and germinate in place. Um, remember that some, yeah. I, I, have, I have a question about 10%. So I've often, often been hesitant to get seeds out of the wild. I usually collect them from my yard. Because if I take 10%, you take 10%, you take 10%, right. you know, and I don't know who else is collecting. Right. So, right, we don't. At this point, we don't. So I, I can't. I can't say unless you wanted to put a little flag there, you know. I just flag and tape, you know, and so that you, yeah, that just popped into my head. Okay. Sure, you could leave a note if it's a nice population and you know others may come and, and want to collect from it, or you try it. There aren't very many people doing this right now, so if you want to make sure you have a group and you and you you know wander around together, that's another way. But we're hoping it yeah, gets more widespread. Yeah. Um, harvesting seeds before they fall, before they dehiss on their own. So they look green to you. They might not look ripe to you. Um, but if they roll off like a ripe fruit, like a ripe blueberry, um, when it's really nice and ripe and ready to eat, um, then they're ready. So hepatica um, will do that. Um, Let's see, um, now I'm too nervous in the, in the moment just to rattle off the, oh, well, trillium are absolutely moist and a little bit green when they are harvested. Um, I'm thinking of uh, meadow root, got it. They're green, they, they sit on top of this, you know, tall meadow root, they sit up there looking perfectly green and you, you walk right by them and say, those seeds aren't ready yet, but sure enough, when you grab them, they'll just roll right off on your hand. The tall meadow root and the short meadow root, early meadow root, Electrum dioecum, will also be harvested green. Um, even dogwoods, so some of the woody plants, you want to harvest a little early. The other important thing to note about um, woody plants and their fruits that are berry-like is um, animals are so excited to get them, typically. So like Cornus um, alternifolia, you need to beat the animals to the roots because you'll be collecting while they're collecting. They don't care. Um, yeah, small tree, shrub fruits, moist seeds. So when the seeds are in a berry and they're, they're covered with flesh, they're, they're moist. So you're gonna keep them moist. And that's an important part to remember. Um, put them in a plastic bag, don't put them in a dry bag and make sure they stay with little air in the bag um, for a period of time during the warm, moist period if they're ripening early in the season. So you're gonna follow, basically follow exactly, mimic exactly what's happening outdoors, but you're gonna bring them in into a controlled environment. So if you harvest seeds in June, Remember that those seeds would typically stay warm and hopefully moist if we didn't have a drought all the way through until now when the temperature starts to drop. So you would put them in a the bag. Um, you would try to keep them moist. Even if they mold a little bit, it's okay. Um, you wanna test the seed over time and make sure it's still firm, but you would just keep them in a, a, not in a, a sunny windowsill um, and not in your refrigerator. So someplace, I keep them on the shelf in the office 
And uh, there they sit from June until September, as a, uh, October, as the temperatures start to drop. Oh. Then I move them into the fridge. So it's mimicking the temperature drop. We also look at the seeds under a microscope um, to make sure that there's actually an endosperm in the seeds. And that'll save a lot of disappointment because um, you may not have any seeds to begin with. So and no, don't worry. He didn't have to look at every seed in the can. <laughs> we look at ten or twenty or thirty. I mean, if you looked at a hundred, you could do your percent. But we we start looking at them, and if they look pretty good for the most part, then we're like, okay, this is a good batch. Um, remember that you're separating the dry aster seed, like fluffy seeds, from the green, woody, drying leaves of the plant, and you don't want too much chaff. But a little bit of chaff in your seed will help you to not over sow. And you'll see some slides of that coming up. Um, we use soil sieves, but any sieves, we use kitchen, kitchen tools, but the soil sieves were donated and they, they work really well for either um, sifting chaff out, they're graduated, so we can stack them up and um, put some seeds in, in the top and it runs right down through into the bottom. But you can also buy certain screens that are produced for um, working with seeds and to separate seeds from chaff. Um, so the, the, the little paint brushes are nice for just gently brushing the seeds off of the stems without getting too much leaf. This is a yummy picture of um, a plate of all the different flesh that we took off the fruits mm -hmm. and I should have put the fruits beside but it didn't so that's you're going to just get those off and you can scrape them off rub them off by hand um all people do it all cultures do it I've seen lots of now demonstrations of people around the world you know just cleaning seeds across the grate um scrubbing off the flesh and then keep them moist you can see the moisture in the jar label them accordingly. Um, the, the chestnut oak on the top, you can see that they're germinating in the bag and that's okay. They'll stay like that for a while until they're, they're ready to be planted. Blood root in this little bottom. Now, the reason they're in tiny little packets is because um, we put everything into um, like serving sizes for people to come to the seed exchange. And that's the um, what we call the solstice gathering for the Finger Lakes Native Plant Society at the end of our you know, season, December, at this time of the solstice, about December 21st. And then we store them in the fridge that's all set aside for seeds. And it's nice to alphabetize them so that you can go back and find them. If you ask me where all my seeds were at home right now, I would be like, I don't know, I've got to go find them. But at work, they're pretty well organized. Um, so, so there were the moist seeds, the cleaning of the moist seeds, the cleaning of some of the dry seeds. And now this is the storage of dry seeds for about one year. Once the year is up and we still have seeds, which we do, we still have, this is 2023. So we still have 2023 seeds. We're now collect 2022 seeds are still left over. We've collected the 2023 seeds. So now we're shifting years. We're gonna take all of our seeds that were sitting on the shelf, waiting for people to come and get them um, and put them into the refrigerator because they're now able to go into long storage and be stored dry in their jars. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. So information that you'll have later, but we can we can move on. Um, things I talked about. Knowing what those moist seeds are and making sure that you keep them moist, even when they want to trick you and then you don't think, well, are these really the moist ones or not? I don't see a fleshy root, but the blood root will have um, a long um, seed pod and it'll split open at the proper time of harvest just with a tap of your thumb on it, typically. And then the seeds will be nice and bronze like these. And this part of the seed is an eliosome. It's not a root, even though it might look like it's germinating. And that's the part that's sweet and that the ants want. And ants are the dis dispersers of these seeds. 
So the ant carries the seed away and eats that sweet part, sweet moist part, and then your blood roots will be germinating for you in places where you never expected. Yeah, stratification. So this part is another confusing part and it um, mimics the whole natural temperature cycle of what these seeds would go through if they were just to fall on the ground and not get eaten <laughs> by birds or other animals um, and, and have a chance to grow on their own. Um, so we're gonna re we're gonna mimic the cycle of warm, cold conditions. And fortunately, they love 40 degrees. So our refrigerators work really, really well. Um, we can just certainly put them outside, but you have to protect them if you put them outside because animals want them always. And animals are curious too. So somebody will dig up your, your wonderfully sown seeds if you don't have them covered in. Hardware cloth is really the best way to, to do that, which is, it's awfully prickly to use, but it, it serves as the best uh, cover. So you make sure it's nice and secure. You can put them in pots. You can sink them in the ground. Um, Ellen Foltz of Amanda's garden has been growing, you've probably heard from her already, um, hopefully more than once. She's wonderful and she grows um, native plants out in Springwater, New York. She's been burying her containers in the ground for years and it works really well, but making sure the tops are covered. You can use a cold frame, um, put your pots in a cold frame, but again, make sure that you have hardware cloth all the way up the sides and another piece of hardware cloth and a, a solid lid that these mice can't get, or chipmunks can't get in and destroy your crop. Um, and we've talked about but I'll repeat it again because these, these are the confusing parts. Seeds that ripen early in the summer have to be warm first. And they might have to be warm and moist first or dry, depending on how they ripen. If the seed is going to be dry stored, it typically looks dry when you're harvesting it. And when you harvest it, the stem below the flower head will, also, will be brown. And then you know your, your seeds are, are ripe enough to, to harvest and dry and store. So the stem must be brown below the seed head, the flower head, and the seeds should fall out of that inflorescence. And then you should be able to determine which is the seed and which is the chaff. So the microscope helps, a dissecting scope, a magnifying glass, and sometimes just you know regular glasses. Mm -hmm. um, some need multiple cycles. So you could start with the warm and then introduce them to cold moist stratification and then bring them back to warm moist and it's spring and you're excited and you want to see them germinate and they go, and they go off. What did I do wrong? Well, unfortunately, you just have to be patient at that point and you have to wait another year. So then you need a place to put these that they're not going to get disturbed by the animals. So your, the, your cold frames, um, your hardware cloth, your, um, yeah, cold, I, I think you, you have to have a frame. So you have to be able to secure them because you're not gonna be able to keep animals away from them, especially if they're outside. They all want to do something in there and they disturb and, and make a mess. So make sure you have a place to keep your pots or your containers for at least two years and know that they're they're safe and sound. Um, that's the multiple year cycle. All of these species that we love so much will take that long or more. Colophyllum, well, I haven't been growing that one because that takes absolutely a very, very long time, like years and years. So the deer don't like to eat them, so I enjoy them out in the wild all the time and I haven't been growing them. So if they're on that kind of a multiple year cycle, do they need the warm, cold, warm again, cold again? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You it's not it. continuous cold. You no. gotta have that warm in between. Right. You don't want to put them back in your fridge. Just leave them out there. But you don't want to forget to water them when things dry out. So, you know, we have a nursery and someone's looking after the nursery um, every day. Yeah. So you, the pots will definitely dry out. Yeah. 
is there an advantage or disadvantage if you have a mother bed going outside and you've got a properly covered to putting your pots in the ground versus just leaving them above? Right. So it's very advantageous to put the pots, sink the pots, yeah, because then they're protected um, from all those free thaw periods. And a free thaw cycle typically doesn't affect the, many of our plants, but it, it can, depending on how much moisture is involved, how much rain we get, and then how the temperatures fluctuate. So there's been years where it's been super wet, and then we have all this like layer of ice and yeah, not very good, and, and a lot of mortality. Other years where the temperature and the, and the moisture have been fairly even, and boy, everything overwinters out in their pots just, just fine. So yeah, sinking is always good if you can do it. Yeah. Uh, covering with the plastic. So I just use our garbage bags um, and I reuse them. They look really good in this picture. I think that was the first year, but we keep trying to reduce and reuse and recycle. Um, so the flats, these are your 10, 20s, uh, 10 inches by 20 inches. And I broadcast so across the top of the flat. And then they go, they went into a hoop initially. And then they were covered in a two inch foam box inside the hoop. This isn't necessary. I This was the first iteration of let's do this without a greenhouse. Um, but now we have the box, the two inch foam box in a somewhat protected area outside. So that way you've created something that moderates your temperatures. Um, so you don't have things heating up if the sun comes out and then cooling way down again um, with this kind of a, a, a small enclosed box. It's not absolutely necessary, but it is working and we keep it in a shaded place. So nobody's getting in there and we do hundreds of flats. And so it's probably more large scale than anybody here would be interested in doing. So I'm not gonna say you have to do it like that. No, you don't. Um, just remember, it could take two to three years and to maintain the moisture, water, and um, yeah, not just trillium and not just erythronium and not just colophyllum, but hepatica and um, hesera too. Trillium are so fun to grow and I would encourage everybody to do it. Um, it takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of time. There are 54 months from seed to flower, but they will do it for you. Um, and you can have your own white and red trillium. And if you live in more acid conditions, you can also have painted trillium. Um, but make sure when you use um, trillium seeds, when you're planting trillium seeds, that they go into a deep container. So th this is a oh, 08 to 10 inch bulb crate. And I just might put some newspaper on the bottom or just pack potting mix in it really snugly. And then sow trillium right on top. Remember that you're sowing seeds to the depth of the seed no matter what the seed is. So, or you're sowing on the surface, no matter what the seed is. This one really kind of blows me away. Sorry, this is so fuzzy, but it's a blow up of that's like almost solid iris seed across the surface of the flat. So that doesn't go deep, it goes surface. Cause it, I guess typically they would grow in a very wet environment. So they would be on the surface of the, the moist surface of their, of their wetland. Um, they will grow in a garden too, iris versa color, but they want light to germinate. Yeah, so do the tiny seeds. <laughs> I said I would show you what over sowing looks like. So every single one of these is a, is like a hundred plants, <laughs> and that's way 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 over sown. So people get really ambitious even when they're um, they're told don't so over sow. So it's really hard, and I, I do it all the time too. So. Um, yeah, more chaff with your seed is going to help you not do this. Um, Lobelia syphilitica wants to be sown on the surface. It wants light to germinate. Another um, shot of covering the, there's some pots in this flat probably, and just uh, soil on the surface of that flat. Um, water them in. 
Um, there's a, there's tips here that will be in hand, um, electronically available to you. And uh, so everything should be reiterated there, but make sure that you follow the recommendations and also that you can email me if you have questions. Um, because some sometimes people write things like I didn't write every word of that. I think some of the volunteers had a hand in it. So I, as I was reading it, it said, well, bottom water only. Well, I remember every year I water right over the top with the rose head. And I don't always have a watering can. Sometimes I'm watering right through the, the greenhouse uses um, you know, a hose from a spigot and a wet regular rose head. Just make sure you're watering from above. You're not watering from the side if you're getting some pressure, because then all your seeds are going to be in one corner of the flat. <laughs> and when you have other people managing, you see that and like, see all those germinating over there? That's because you water from the side. Um, now, potting up and transplanting. So we've, we've gone through the seeds. Um, we're, you're going to look at the root system of the plant before you decide whether or not to pot it up or transplant it out. They definitely need to have roots in order to survive. So wait if they're tiny and um, if they're slow. Um, and uh, yeah, just wait till you see a nice, nice root system, multiple branching root system. You know, that's about that long, I guess, somewhere in there. Um, roots that are starting to come out of the bottom of the pot and they're white and fleshy, then you've got a good, you've got a good start. They, they'll, they'll work out just fine in this world. Um, little geraniums, um, geranium maculatum. Yeah, going from the flat into their little four inch or three inch or two inch pots. Um, I, I typically don't use the tiny pots. I like to use at least a four inch pot. And depth of your flat, did I talk about that? Maybe I didn't. But when you sow seeds, you know, except for the trillium that are going to go deep because they're going to put out a really long root system first before you ever see anything on the surface. Um, but most seeds don't want to be too wet. So you want to have just about four, four inches for them to have not an overly moist environment to grow in. Um, White Oak Nursery is a wonderful source for woody plants and Jim Ingle introduced me to these um, Anderson pots. Notice the root system growing straight down instead of circling because we don't, we can't always get to these things in the right time to get them planted out before yeah, you have them being circling and getting confused in the pots and pot bound. And then pr providing some shade um, is important if you're growing out in the sun. This is a really harsh environment out here next to the hoop. Um, so we figure out how to shade these things occasionally. Um, Rime that you might use in your vegetable garden works really well over seedlings. Um, shading comes in, in all shapes and sizes and forms. You can find an old screen um, to make uh, a shading, a shade cloth out of, um, or you know, buy things from Johnny's. I think they're a really good source. Um, I, I look at all the tools and all the stuff in the Johnny's catalog more than I do the vegetable plants, but I love to grow vegetables too. Um, good plants to propagate from seeds. All, all of these plants are wonderful. We've had success with each and every one of them. Um, so marsh marigold, the not, it would like it only very moist. Just remember that if it's growing moist, it wants to be moist for sure. They like wet feet. You can't take them from um, a wetland and put them into your garden very well. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll move right along. Cultural conditions, think about those. So in chronological order, bloodroot will grow for you and you can grow it from seed for sure. So go out and find the seeds um, in June. Yeah, and trillium would be much later, July, August. Don't forget to look high and low. So when you're looking for the wild ginger, you're gonna have to look very low. The picture's deceiving, but the leaves are gonna cover up the seed pod. Uh, it's down there right at the soil surface. Jeffersonia is a rare plant, but it's super easy to grow. And it's 
found in the trade. So it's been introduced to the wildflower garden for decades ago. Um, and I've been growing it. But if you go to populations here, if you find wild po populations here, I would say skip it because it is a rare plant in our region. Um, and it grows in, I think, only three places in New York State. But you could probably order it and grow it in your garden and enjoy it. It's a beautiful plant. Notice how wet, marsh marigolds, skunk cabbage, and iris, versicolor, geranium maculatum, and um, uh, uvularia grandiflora. Uvularia grandiflora blooms very early in spring, and then geranium maculatum a little bit later in spring. These seeds you're going to collect carefully because they're spring loaded. So know that when you go out to find your seed pods on your various plants that you've decided that you want to grow, um, these are going to fly away before you get there. So you can use the little mesh bags. Jewelry bags are great with the little drawstring. Um, so put the jewelry bag over the over the whole pod and the stem, and then you'll be able to collect those seeds right in the jewelry bag when the, when you go back to check on it. Um, understand that um, some of these plants in this picture that this looks great but some are not native to, to New York state and some are a little bit you know, close, but a little bit farther out. The red buds that everybody wants are a Pennsylvania native tree and in over limestone, which a lot of us are on, um, they are an invasive species, unfortunately. In the Monday Wildflower Garden, I have to cut them and paint their stumps with Roundup because they're also really, really hard to pull out. So not on limestone, you could probably have just fine luck with growing red buds now that it's warming. Um, and then the polemonium repans, the blue plant, I would recommend it highly for a garden. That's the um, Susquehanna River Basin and, and south of here. Um, Virginia bluebells, we want, we want those. Now, to go out and find their seeds, you have to catch them at just the right time um, because they're going to disappear. They're going to go right back underground. They're a true spring ephemeral, and you won't find a single speck of them. When they're starting to look like lettuce that's really gone the other way, um, that's when you want to harvest the whole thing. Just slice it off with a knife and put it in a brown paper bag. Let the seeds fall to the bottom of the bag, and then sow them as soon as possible. So, yeah, you want them to dry so you can get them and separate from the wilty lettuce-like leaves but then they want to be sown right away. Um, what's next? Yeah, Virginia bluebells, columbine, super easy. The seeds are gonna be held for you as you pass by them. You're gonna brush them and you're gonna hear the seeds rattling and you're gonna know when you hear them that they're ripe and you can just shake them out wherever you want them. They will grow on shade, shaded areas. They'll grow on dry, gravelly areas, they'll grow um, in moist areas tall. But but notice where you collected them from. If you collected them from a dry gravelly site, then you want to keep them in the dry gravelly site. But you might also find them in the moist woodland. So wherever they are in their habitat, that's their that's what they're set up to do. And keep keep that that keep that going along. Um, Jack in the pulpits are fun, but remember that they're hot. They're filled with oxalic acid. So you would burn your eyes if you were cleaning the pulp off of this and then you touched your face. Um, so what you wear gloves when you're working with these seeds, but they're really rewarding. They're slow and you have to have patience, but they're super fun. I wish I had added the, um, the red form of the white into this picture. I looked at it, but I didn't get the chance to add it. But yeah, sometimes you can find um, berries that are mauve colored, fuchsia colored, and that still has the big fat peduncle. This part right here tells you that this is, um, when it's in flower, it tells you that it's Actea pachypoda, not Actea rubra, because we also have the red form, Actea rubra. Small peduncle, little stem there where the fruits are hanging. Um, multiple seeds inside of each fruit. So you're going to open these up and then you're going to clean off the flesh. It's easy. They just kind of fall right out. Um, but then you're going to keep them moist and not let them dry out. 
Yeah, there's three or four seeds in each berry. Um, talked about those. Penstemon hirsutus is a lovely little plant. Doesn't need any treatment. So some of these seeds, I should have mentioned, the columbine doesn't need any cold moist stratification. Just need to dry it and store it and grow it. And it'll start germinating for you uh, the year that the seeds are ripening, especially this year. I have um, little columbine seedlings all over my gravel patio at home. Same with the penstemon hirsutus. However, the seed, the seed um, hulls are very hard. So this is the one that I use a rolling pin, another kitchen tool to um, crack open the, the hulls and get the seeds out. And then they're very tiny. So remember, you're gonna have lots and lots of those. Um, our native grasses and mints are super combination. So cool season grasses get big, fast, and they're easy to um, identify and collect and use as ground cover. And they'll, they'll remain in the collection um, or in your garden for a period of time and then they'll sort of, sort of start to wane. They won't look like this for you know, all, all time, like the warm season grasses. Warm season grasses are definitely one that will, once you put them in, they're big clumpers, they're just gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger and do really well for you. Um, but don't forget about the cool season native grasses. I call them the placeholders. Um, all of the different milkweeds, super easy and fun. Know that, I should put the slide in, that when you collect milkweed seed, you're gonna hold the pod so that you don't have a lot of fluff in your house. <laughs> hold the pod by the end, that the, the seeds are pointing one direction, they look like fish scales. So hold the pod with the thumb and forefinger and then just, kind of shave the seeds right off into a bag or a dish or a bowl, and you'll be much happier. If you collect those pods and you put them in a bag and you let them turn into, then you're just gonna let, let them go. Yeah, so all of these are fun. Um, know that the lilium, um, Canada lily at the top will take multiple years, like, you know, eight to 10 years to get that big, but, you know, but we all have time for that, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's our butterfly weed and coreopsis. That's not exactly one of our natives, but we let them in because they're a good pollinator plant. Um, thimble weed, the bigger flowered one is the Canada. And we usually like that, but we always usually end up with the um, cylindrica, which is the very small flowered one. So if you get any seeds from us, know they're mostly cylindrica. <laughs> can't sort them out anymore, they all got mixed up. But if you can find somebody who has anemone virginiana, I would make sure you keep it separate from your anemone cylindrica. One day you'll have no flowers or hardly any flowers. Menarda fistulosa, super easy to grow. One of those that doesn't need any treatment. Cardinal flower, moist, cold, the bee balm. Another one that some people have, have a problem with controlling this. They think it's gonna take over their garden and other people can't seem to get enough of it. I think the trick is that you wanna have um, some moist, a moist shade area or a lot of good soil or actually water. Um, yep, great blue lobelia will grow in all, all conditions you know, dry and wet and shade and sun. And the turtle heads are a plant that we're looking to, to have in our garden so that we're supporting the Baltimore checker spot. You'll find those caterpillars on the chelonies. Combining all of these into the meadow is I think a good option for people as we go forward and trying to reduce lawns and um, Grow Wild and Scandi Atlas is working really hard to do that all around Scandi Atlas Lake. New England Aster comes in the pink form, not just in the nurseries. You know that if you look for pink New England Aster, you should be able to find it. It's, it's out there. Just have to have to take take longer time to go out and, and look and, and pick them on, among all the purple ones. Um, our gentian and drusii has been persistent here, but deer do like them. Yeah. I have a question about the asters. For the first time this year, I got some pink ones in my yard. 
If I collect those seeds, will they always be pink or will they go back to purple? Well, it depends because the things hybridize within the garden. So uh, I've had very good luck with collecting pink and keeping the pink growing, but I can't say that that would happen for sure. Um, so another reason why we want to go out into the wild and continue collecting in the wild and create areas of um, um, species species for harvest for seed, but then those areas that we create for of species for harvest for seed will then have to be redone over time. So they might they might be collected from for five years at the most, and then we're going to take them up, take them down, tear them apart, plow them under, and then do it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by collecting from the wild, from different populations and bringing them in and starting them. And that, that's gonna be what you see as the seed increase um, for, for this area to go forward, yeah. And that's another talk, thank you, but yeah. So knowing that the asters will work for you, this is the same area that had all of those cool season grasses. And then it, it moved into asters and grasses. And eventually it would be asters and goldenrods. And then grasses in the fall, among shrubs. Uh, we're going to look at the grasses a little more closely. So I don't know how familiar this audience is with our cool season grasses, but these, these are the ones that you will find and will be easy for you to grow and introduce to your gardens. The bottle brush grass is, is found along riverbanks. Um, and it does like shaded areas. It can take moist to dry conditions, but not full sun. Where Canada rye likes more full sun, gets really, really big. So just be prepared. This the bottle brush will be much smaller. Um, our native wild elements. So we have the bottle brush, the Canada, the Virginia, and um, the riparian. All the ryes are in that in that photo, and they will germinate in the fall. The warm season grasses are yellow prairie grass, formerly Indian grass, Sorgastrum newtons, and then the, um, sorry, missing the little blue stem and the big blue stem, but maybe we'll find them in the next few pictures. I'm not sure where they went. So golden rods that are wonderful to use in your gardens, easy to grow from seed, I call them the, the civilized golden rods because they don't act like Altissima or Gigantea, which will become whole field golden rods. Yeah, right along the path. So the, the one, the slide before was the um, Solidago flexicollis, this be Solidago cesia. Flexicollis typically is found in the lower wetter areas, cesia up in the higher dry areas, but they'll grow intermixed. Don't forget the vines and the shrubs. So Amelanchia, bird food for sure. All of mine are bare. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful in all seasons. Great fall color, great flowers, early, early spring. And supports that. The shad bush, um, Staphylia trifolia is, I'm sorry, not is a uh, bladder nut. Um, shad bush was the amelanch here. So bladder nuts, I want to say, are wonderful restoration species. Just know that if you just, it, they will typically not look like this in your garden for as long a period of time. They would become massive. So we have an older Staphylia trifolia bladder nut in the uh, entrance to the wildflower garden that is. Um, probably something that will have to end up being taken out with the backup. Mm -hmm. So just know it's probably better for restoration area, natural area. I would not recommend it for a garden unless you had so much room that you didn't care and you wanted a great big thicket and you had lots and lots of honeysuckle and you were gonna replace all that honeysuckle and buckthorn and prove it with um, black or not. Mm -hmm. but otherwise I can't recommend it. Um, nine bark. <laughs> understanding that they're these are not the greatest pictures um i have some really nice specimens and they do grow really well from seed as does the bladder nut as does amelanchier but 
the bronze that you'll find in the tray, and this is probably that, is not um, conducive to insect feeding. And insects do want to feed on nine bark leaves. So anything that's got that bronze foliage, typically in the spring, it's there on the underside of some of the aster leaves, like the white wood aster, and that's there to deter insect herbivory during early spring growth. But it goes away later on, so insects can feed on that plant later. However, a cultivar of the bronze nine bark never goes back to green. It always stays bronze, so no insects can benefit from the leaf of that plant. So if we're willing to feed the insects, you know, both flowers, pollen, nectar, and leaves, which I think most of us are, if we're habitat gardening, then we want to avoid those cultivars. Um, Sambuca canadensis, the American elderberry, is probably one of the all-time favorites for the huge platform for insects, great for birds. Know that you have to, as a garden plant, you have to rejuvenate them because they will get really um, woody and stemmy, but you can cut them right back to the ground and they come back looking looking like that. Aronia melanocarpa or chokeberry is a deer candy, so beware if you have a deer issue, but if you don't, or if you have a deer fence, um, try aronias and the chokeberry is um, like number one above blueberry and even um, um, shed or Juneberries for um, antioxidants. They're not super sweet, but you can add them to your baked goods and still get the benefits. And, and somebody's used them as a hedge, just beautiful flowers in the spring, fall color and grapefruit. There they are. Rubisodoratus makes a wonderful jam, makes a beautiful hedge if it likes the spot. So know that where you put it is where you want it. Another one like the um, like the uh, bladder nut, you might need heavy equipment to remove it. I had to remove um, a Rubisodoratus from the vegetable garden bed with a tractor. <laughs> it got so big. Um, alternate leaf dogwood. That's the one that if you don't go out there early and collect those fruits, everyone else is going to get them. Red stem and it's Cornus cerisia and Cornus amomum. The shrubby dogwoods, easy to grow, easy to grow from, from their fruits. The spice bush is a little bit slower, but again, if it's a, a good fruiting year, if you have female plant, know that you have to have two, male and a female, if you're gonna get fruits, know that they support that awesome caterpillar that turns into that beautiful butterfly. And thank you all. I hope I didn't go too much. I guess yeah, questions. Yeah. Thanks for those questions during the talk, but any more questions? And you can take a look at this now and, and ask, ask any questions, um, hopefully I can answer them. Um, but email me and I can get information to you. There's a, a pollinator booklet that was developed um, if you wanna know more about what what are the host plants for specific insects, especially our native bees. So that's available online. And um, also another work by uh, Fowler, if you haven't seen his work, um, Mid-Atlantic work on what plants support which insects if you're interested in the specialists and, and growing for them. Yeah. So um, if you collect these this year and you're swimming here, no, good question. So the timing, super important. As we collected seeds all year long, we started in June, but we're still collecting seeds right now. Had to push from the seed block, which was supposed to be yesterday because of the rain. Um, so we'll do it next week and go out and get lots of aster seeds and goldenrod seeds and anything else we find. Um, some of the fruits will still be there. We're going to sow them in January. Yeah. So that we're mimicking exactly what would happen then if they fell on the ground. So you would put them in the refrigerator and then take them out? Well, depends. No, not exactly. No. If they if they were collected, if they were collected in June and we kept them warm as if it were they were outside, we keep them warm and moist. 
right? And then they went in the fridge in October, early, that late September. As soon as the temperature started dropping into the 40s, which was late this year, right? We had, it's been warm, I mean, it was 80 degrees. So knowing that climate change is really turning everything around and upside down, but you can still follow what we, what we know as the typical cycle. And the typical cycle would have been yeah, September, mid-September, temperatures will start to drop. And we would even usually have a frost here in mid-September. And now a lot of that's pushed to a month later. But um, yeah, if you're going to store your seeds for the that long time, if you collected them in June, then you wouldn't want to keep them from June to January warm. But you know, if you were okay, and why do I sow in January? Well. I don't know. I mean, you can sow now. You can sow. You can sow immediately. You know, you can keep. You can keep sowing. I just do it because I'm collecting everything, and then getting people together to help. And we do. You know, 125 flats. Um, you know, 80 or so species. So we wait till January, and then we put it all together in there. We sow everything in their flats, water them in, and then they go back in the fridge because they would typically be outside. So, and the fridge could be your fridge, or it could be mine at home, or it could be that box that I showed you. And that's a, that kind of moderates at about 40. Or it could be a cold frame with pots and not even in the ground, or it could be a sunken pot in the ground. So there's all these various ways that you can mimic what would happen to that tea that just fell on the ground. Yeah, it's even when I start to say it, <laughs> say it. Yes. So one of the, the, the things that I find a little bit difficult to say, go out and look and see what the normal habitat would be and what's growing there. I look outside and I don't see any normal habitat. Anywhere. <laughs> cut down, raised as agriculture in some way, and finally grown back up. But I have no idea what I should actually be looking at because I don't think it's there. Excellent. Where do you find exactly a rapid site? Yeah. So, okay. So let me begin with um, the forest because we're supposed to be forest here. So our second growth forest is really the best, you know, we can do. And we have plenty of second growth. Um, where are they and, and are they accessible and do we have permission? Um, so typically we don't, unless it's private land. Uh, the state is not open for us to collect from their forest. Even though they harvest all the timber, they're not really excited about us to go in and collect seeds um, and grow plants. Um, but roadsides are fine. Um, seasonal roads. So where I've typically gone is um, private land, second growth forest, uh, without a lot of invasive species um, changes. So where are they? Um, you, yeah, you have to find out where they are because we have so many invasive species. Um, but they're they're there. Um, they, they are they're there. Uh, but you do have to you have to kind of ferret them out. That's for sure. So good question. But seasonal road edges, um, that's okay. You can you can you can get you can get those seeds from the roadside. Um, or back road edges. Um, and then you can ask. You know, do a cold call if you want. If you think someone has a nice forest, you know, just knock, knock on their door and say, I would like to collect these. You know, can I? I see seeds on your roadside. Is it okay if I collect from between your field and your and this, uh, this back road? But, but more than that, in some way, how do we know looking along that road that this is a population? A population that we would want to mimic in our yard. Okay. Because our yard is wetter than this, or rockier than this, or yeah. So I I have gone to places that, that have really inspired me, 
And and if um, if I go to say to Jefferson County to the Cajun Barrens, then I look at that at that habitat and I look at that species composition and then I say, how can I mimic this? Um, and that one has certainly inspired me. So I can grow in the gravel. You know, I can grow in my driveway, right? My driveway is now, I've taken drive really gravel and put it next to my garden and quote unquote patio. Um, and then we created that stream bank restoration based on warm season grasses that grow in the pavement barrens that are in New York State. But where do you go get the seeds? Is the next question. So we have the Finger Lakes Native Plant Society seed walk, and that is scheduled for next weekend now. So this whole room is invited. <laughs> um, you know, it, it really, uh, even though typically I'm like, oh my God, we can't take more than about, you know, 10 to 12 people, but please come. I know you won't, but you know, you're welcome to come. Um, and we're going to go to the Arnott Forest, and it's a Cornell University forest. So the interesting thing about that place is that it was all the trees were harvested uh, a number of years ago. Um, they're doing a, they're doing a timber part one. They want the money. Two, they want to do the research on what happens when you harvest all the trees, and then you put up a deer exposure using the slash from the harvested timber. So they made these 10 foot walls of, of um, tops of trees in these quadrants. And then we have access to those areas um, for, for what has come in subsequently. And we're seeing without, with the exclusion of deer, we're seeing so many neat things. Um, but again, right on the roadside, driving up to the Arnott Forest, you can see a lot of those same species, but and then with more deer question. So, right, it's a, it's a good question. And I think we're gonna keep trying to answer that by one, by creating seed increase areas, specific seed increase areas that are Yeah, any other? We, we have one question on the um, Q and A. What was the source of the large pots for transplanting that you mentioned? Large pot of uh, the crate, the maybe they mean the ones that quite long. Oh, oh, yeah, Anderson. Sorry, the large, the deep pots, the deep square pots with the, and they have it, they call them, they call them the tree band. They have an open bottom. So not only do the roots grow straight down, but they can also come out of the bottom of the pot. Mm -hmm. Where, where am I can get my close enough to this? Where, where can you get them? Anderson is the name of the company. You have to order them, and they do come from across the country, and you have to pay shipping. And, it's, and they're expensive, but they last. I have a question about um, what what is the the status of seeds, you know, in general? I know seed people are concerned about uh, this. The ability to get seeds and grow, and you talked about seeds increase and seed increase. Yeah, can you just say a little bit about what that means? Seed is the, it increase? Yeah, the, so a strategy was put in place, the National Seed Strategy, based on wildflower fires, wildfires out west, and mostly hurricanes in the east. So the Mid Atlantic put together um, a Mid Atlantic seed bank. Um, and now we're trying to mimic that in this area. Right. So it's just beginning to form and we want people to get involved. Um, so I can't say that we have, you know, a hub yet, but we're definitely working on seed increase for this area so that places where invasive species are a problem and where people are doing large scale weeding of invasives, and restoration, the seeds from this area that are of local genotype are responsibly collected, meaning they've been collected from different populations of that species from different places within miles apart over time so that that represents that one collection represents um, 
genetic information for timing of flowering and ge genetic information for, for soils and ge genetic information for climate uh, is all within the seed for that species. So is that done by Cornell? Who's no, it's not. No, it's not. So who's organizing? Uh, well, the person who organized the Maryland Seed Bank is is moving this direction now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and we're we're hoping to hear from him. Actually, you can hear from him. Um, he's going to speak on the Finger Lakes Native Plant Society. Um, so we have a Zoom. We have a similar setup. Zoom hybrid talk. And his talk will be in. Um, you have to check our website for his talk. Yeah, what's his I don't name? want to say the wrong one. What's his name? Ed Toad. Ed Toad. Yeah, check the website for Ed's talk. And your seed collection next weekend? That's at Cornell. Yeah, it will be at the Arnott Forest. We've okay. gone. We've gone to the the road edges in state land, you know, where the seasonal road passes through. And we've gone to private land. Um, we've gone to um, Arnott Forest once. We're going to return to Arnott Forest. Um, yeah, a few, quite a few places over time. Yeah, that was. Um, do you have any um, problems like when you have areas you collect from? Do you ever find that they're not there are areas that were good that aren't good anymore? Uh, yeah, <laughs> things change over time. Yeah. Um, Roads get widened, mm -hmm. trees get cut down. Yeah, um, yes, they clean out the ditches. Mm -hmm. um, so all of those things can affect populations of plants, and then subsequently their seed. Yes, mm -hmm. right. So you you have to scout to make sure that the seeds are going to be there before you take group of people. Mm -hmm. But we do that. Yeah. My seed collections is you know, on a much smaller scale than what you're doing, obviously. But um, what I do after I collect seeds is I put them in little envelopes because they're easy to do to store in my refrigerator once the weather gets cold. Yeah. How do you feel about envelopes versus jars or plastic? Envelopes within the jar. So once you have a dry seed and it's been dry stored for so it's dry, then then keep it dry by putting it in the envelope. I mean our refrigerators now are much drier than they were, but still in the jar would be better. And in the envelope in the jar is fine. Or in a sealed plastic bag, yeah. So whatever, safe space. You have to save on space, I, I realize too. Good luck, everyone. Keep <laughs> trying. <laughs> Don't give up growing. <laughs> I have a question. 